Thank you. The, uh, the title of my uh, talk is The Legitimate Role of Government in a Free Society. Now, in the course of my uh, comments, I'm going to say many things that will depart uh, from conventional wisdom on a whole range of topics. Um, some of the things I may say, I say might be interpreted as uh, insensitive, mean, mean-spirited, uncaring, and politically incorrect. Now, to the extent that any of those things are true in your opinion, uh, you should feel free to raise any kind of question during the question-answer uh, period. Uh, and raise tough questions. Um, don't worry about, um, don't worry about uh, giving me an easy ride because I'm your guest. Uh, uh, raise, raise tough questions. Um, don't worry about insulting me. I am uninsultable. Um, the only way you could possibly insult me is suggest I'm not pretty good in basketball. <coughs> and that's a math matter of uh, ethnic pride that I take seriously. Um, <clears throat> one of the justifications for the growth of government in our country far beyond what the founders envision is to promote fairness and justice. Now, that's a worthy goal, but we might also at the same time ask, well, what is fairness and justice? What is the legitimate role of government in a free society? Let me just spend a few minutes discussing what the founders thought was the legitimate role for the federal government. And to do so, let's turn to the rule book that they gave us, namely the United States Constitution. And most of what the founders uh, saw as the legitimate role for the federal government is found in Article I, Section 8 of the United States Constitution. Let me just uh, briefly quote uh, some sections thereof. It says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. Congress has the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and Indian tribes. They're authorized by the Constitution to coin money to establish post offices and post roads, to raise and support uh, armies for the defense of our country. Now, the framers of the Constitution granted Congress taxing and spending authority for these and a few other activities. That is, according to the United States Constitution, Congress is authorized to do 21 things. Now, nowhere in the Constitution do we find authority for Congress to tax and spend for up to three quarters of what Congress taxes and spends for today. In other words, <clears throat> there's no constitutional authority for farm subsidies, bank bailouts, food stamps, not to mention midnight basketball. <laughs> now, a lot of people will say, well, Williams, you're, that's just too narrow a reading of the Constitution. And they'll tell us that we have a living Constitution. Well, ladies and gentlemen, when anyone says that we have a living Constitution, that's the same as saying we do not have a Constitution at all. That is, for rules to mean anything, they must indeed be fixed. And to get a feeling of that, uh, how many of you would like to play me poker tonight and the rules be living? <laughs> that, that is, depending on the circumstances, my two pair can beat your full house. Um, and, and however, the framers in their wisdom, they did give us Article 5 as a means to amend the Constitution. But most of what has been done uh, has not come through amendments to the Constitution. Now, I think we can safely say that we made a significant departure from the constitutional principles of individual freedom that made us a rich nation in the first place. And these constitutional principles were individual liberty and limited government. Now, these principles 
were, were uh, embodied in our nation through the combined institutions of free enterprise and ownership and private ownership of property. Now, through numerous successful attacks, private property and free enterprise in our nation are mere skeletons of their past. And Thomas Jefferson anticipated this when he said, the natural progress of things is for government to gain ground and for liberty to lose. Now, the best way of looking at this process of government gaining ground and liberty you, uh, losing is to look at what has happened to government taxation and spending. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one way to look at taxation. Taxation rep taxes represent government claims on private property. And indeed, if government were to tax private property at 100%, it would confiscate private property. An even better measure of what the government does, how we're losing our liberty, is to look at, t at spending. Let's go back to 1902. In 1902, just to give you an idea of the, of the progress that we've made, in progress in quotes. In 1902, expenditures at all levels of government, federal, state, and local levels of government, totaled $1.7 billion. In 1902, the average taxpayer paid $60 a year in federal, state, and local taxes. In fact, from 1787, until 1920, federal expenditures, except during wartime, were only 3% of the GDP, as compared to today, where it's well over 20% of the GDP. Today, federal expenditures are over $2.6 trillion. State and local governments spend over a trillion. The average taxpayer today pays $9,000 a year in federal, state, and local taxes. Now, what does this mean? What's the significance of this? Well, the significance is, as time goes by, you and I own less and less of our most valuable property, namely, ourselves and the fruits of our labor. That is, the average American works from January 1st until the 1st of May, to pay federal, state, and local taxes. And that means we're going on five months out of the year where we do not decide how the fruits of our labor will be used. Somebody else makes that decision for us. Now keep in mind, a working definition of slavery is that you work 12 months and it's someone else that makes the decision how the fruits of your labor will be used. In the economic sphere, the founders thought that relatively free markets, or what's called capitalism, was the most effective social organization for the promotion of individual freedom. Indeed, capitalism is defined as a system wherein individuals are free to pursue their own interests so long as they do not violate the property rights of others. There is voluntary exchange there are private property rights held in goods and services. And much of the original intent of the United States Constitution, as seen in the document itself, and if you read a document such as the Federalist Paper, was to bring about a climate in which this kind of social organization could occur. That is, highly limited government. And to get an idea how far we've gone from uh, uh, the, uh, what the framers envisioned, if you read Federalist Paper 45, for those of you who do not know, the Federalist Papers were written by John Jay, James Madison, and Alexander uh, Hamilton. And it was an effort to get the states to ratify the Constitution. And so they were trying to argue with the American people what is in the Constitution. And in Federalist Paper 45, Madison was explaining what the Constitution provided. And he said, and I'm virtually quoting him, he says, <coughs> The powers that we have given the central government, meaning Congress, are few and well-defined and restricted mostly to external affairs. Those powers left with the people and the states are indefinite and numerous. Now, if you turn that upside down, you have what we have today. 
that is the powers of the federal government, are indefinite, numerous, and ill-defined. The great benefit, the great benefit of the free enterprise system is that through private ownership and control, it minimizes the capacity of one person to coerce another person. Additionally, the coercive powers of the state are minimized to what we might consider to be the legitimate functions of the state. And what are those legitimate functions of a state or a government? One legitimate function is to protect you and me from international thugs violating our private property rights. So that says that one legitimate function of government is to provide for national defense. Another legitimate function of government at some level is to protect you and me from domestic thugs violating our private property rights. So that says that police services should be provided. And, and ladies and gentlemen, when I say private property, I don't mean just houses and cars. Your body is your private property. That is, I, Walter Williams, belongs to Walter Williams. And you belong to you. You are your private property. Uh, other legitimate functions of a state in a free society are those of enforcing constitutional order, the adjudication of disputes, and the provision of certain public goods, public goods as, in define, as an economist would define them. In order to pay for these legitimate and constitutionally mandated functions of the federal government, we each are obligated to pay our share. For the last half century, <coughs> sorry, for the last half, half century, free enterprise and what it implies has been under unrelenting attack in our country. Americans from all walks of life, whether they realize it or not, have shown a deep and abiding contempt for private property and economic freedom and personal privacy. Free enterprise is threatened today, somewhat ironically, not because of its failure. It's threatened because of its success. That is, capitalism has been so successful in eliminating the traditional problems of mankind, that is, pestilence, famine, gross poverty, that all other human problems appear to us to be at once inexcusable and unbearable. The desire by many Americans to eliminate these so-called unbearable and inexcusable problems has led us away from the basic ideals and principles upon which our prosperous nation was built. <clears throat> In the name of other ideals, such as equality of income, race and sex balance, affordable housing, medical care, prescription drugs, energy conservation, just name a few. We have abandoned many personal freedoms. As a result of the widespread control by government in an effort to achieve these so-called higher objectives, we are increasingly being subordinated to the point where considerations of personal liberty are but secondary and tertiary matters, and very often they're treated as dirt. Now, you might say, <coughs> you might say, what's this guy talking about, a, a freedom to American being treated as dirt? Let me just give you one example. Imagine I send a letter to the United States Congress, and I tell them, my name is Walter Williams, and I am an emancipated adult. I am I am perfectly able to take care of my own retirement needs. Should I fail to do so, let me die on the streets or let me beg. But stop taking money out of my check for Social Security. I can take care of myself. How do you think that would be greeted? <laughs> be greeted with contempt. Now here's someone telling me how much I should set aside out of each week's pay for retirement. How about uh, telling me how much I should set aside each week for housing or for food or for my daughter's education. I'm sure in the latter 
If Congress were to uh, suggest doing that, we would view it as tyranny. Now, the ultimate end to this process is totalitarianism, which is nothing more than a reduced form of servitude. Now, I am not saying that we are a totalitarian nation yet. But if you ask the question, which way are we headed, tiny steps at a time, are we headed towards more personal liberty, or are we headed towards more control of, the, uh, uh, of our lives by government, it would have to unambiguously be the latter. Now keep in mind that if you take tiny steps towards any goal, it's just a matter of when you're going to get there. Or as the great philosopher David Hume said, it's seldom that liberty of any kind is lost all at once. It's always lost bit by bit. Or actually it was put better by a late colleague of mine, Leonard Reed, who was the founder of the Foundation for Economic Education in New York. And he said, Leonard Reed said, if you wanted to, if you wanted to take liberty away from Americans, you had, to, you had to know how to cook a frog. And Leonard Reed said, you can't cook a frog by putting on a pot of boiling water and then throwing the frog in the water because the frog's reflexes are so quick that as soon as his feet touched the boiling water, he would hop away and be free. Leonard Reed said that the way to cook a frog is to put on a pot of cold water, put the frog in the water, and heat it up bit by bit. And by the time the frog realized he was being cooked, it was too late. <laughs> That's the same thing with Americans. If anybody came over here talking about taking away all of our liberties all at once, we would righteously rebel but they can talk about taking away our liberties bit by bit. The primary justification for this attack on private property and individual liberty can be found in people's desire for government to do good. We all say things like, government should help the poor, government should help the elderly, government should help the disadvantaged, government should help college students, and other deserving segments of our society. Well, it's nice to say that. But we have to recognize, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, that government has no resources of its very own. In other words, those programs coming out of Washington or out of your state legislature, the state capital, they don't represent congressmen and legislators reaching in their own pockets and sending out the money. Moreover, there's no tooth fairy or Santa Claus giving them the money. Now, when you recognize that government has no resource of its very own, it forces you to recognize that the only way government can give one American citizen one dollar is to first, through intimidation, threats, and coercion, confiscate that dollar from some other American. We Americans, and others around the world, but we're talking about America, we support government doing things that if an individual did the identical thing privately, we would roundly condemn him as an ordinary despicable thief. <clears throat> For example, uh, suppose I see an elderly lady sleeping out on a grate in the dead of winter. She's hungry, she needs some uh, medical attention and some shelter. Suppose I walk up to Ken Cribb with a gun in my hand, and I say, Ken, give me your $200. Then having gotten his $200, I go downtown and help the lady out. I buy her some medical attention, some food, and get her some housing. Would you find me guilty of a crime? I'd be guilty of crime. What, is, what, what crime would I be guilty of? I'd be guilty of theft. And theft is defined as taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. Now, most Americans would agree with me. Yeah, Williams, you're a thief. Now, here's the problem. Is there any conceptual distinction between that act, where I walked up the can and took his money, and when the agents of the United States Congress, namely the IRS, tells me, Williams, you know that $200 that you earned last week, and you had planned to buy 
two nice bottles of Lafitte Rothschild Bordeaux wine with them. <laughs> you will not do that. You'll give the money to us, and we will go downtown and help the lady out. There's no conceptual between those two acts, distinction. That is, both acts involve taking the rightful property of one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong. Now, if you press me for a distinction, I can only find one, and that distinction ought to be trivial to moral people. That is, the first act where I walked up to Ken, that is illegal theft. The second act is legal theft. It's just a matter of legality. Now you say, well, Williams, it's, it's legal. Well, legality alone for moral people cannot be our uh, guide. And that's because many things in this world are or were legal, but clearly immoral. That is, slavery was legal. Did that make it moral? The Nazi persecution of the Jews was legal. Did that make it moral? That is, we have to ask the moral question here. Is there a moral case? Can you establish a moral case for taking by force what belongs to one person and giving it to another to whom it does not belong? Now, in my 71 years of life, I know most of you guessing I'm not really 71. I'm like 43 or something like that. I have not come up with a moral case for doing that. Now, don't misunderstand me. I believe, and matter of fact, my wife and I, we participate in helping our fellow man in need. We give to a lot of charitable causes. But reaching into one's own pockets to help his fellow man in need is praiseworthy and laudable. Reaching into somebody else's pocket to help your fellow man in need is worthy of condemnation. Now, in other words, we have to recognize in order for government to do good, it has to first do bad, namely takes something that belongs to somebody else. Now, in a free society, we want most, if not all, of our relationships to be voluntary and we want to minimize involuntary exchange. You know, sometimes people get worked up about involuntary versus voluntary. And I like to tell people, look, I love seduction, but I'm against rape. I love any kind of seduction. Now, uh, now what's the essence of seduction? And a lot of people, a lot of young people here have their hormones in the roar, in the uproar. <laughs> so they don't know the full interpretation for seduction. Seduction is said to occur when we proposition our fellow man in the following way. We say to him, if you make me feel good, I'll make you feel good. And for those of you who remember your game theory, we call that a positive sum game. That is, both parties benefit in their own estimation. Let me give you an example of seduction. I walk into my grocer with three dollars in my hand and I proposition him. I say, if you make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'll make you feel good, give you, two give you $3. He's better off because he values the $3 more than he values the milk, and I'm better off because I value the milk more than $3. That's what we mean by a positive sum game. Both people win. Now, the essence of rape is when we proposition our fellow man in the following way. We say to him, if you don't make me feel good, I'm going to make you feel bad. That's a zero-sum game. That is, in order for one person to be better off, it of necessity requires another person to be worse off. An example of that would be where I walked into the grocer with a gun in my hand. And I say, if you don't make me feel good, give me that gallon of milk, I'm going to make you feel bad, blow your brains out. Clearly, I benefit. But the grocer is made worse off. Now, by the way, a lot of people will tell me, they'll say to me, Williams, you know all these things you rail about? You know, we are a democracy and has majority rules. Well, first I try to, tell, try to tell the people, if we are a democracy, 
our founders damn sure did not intend for us to be. That is, the, many, many statements by our founders condemned the idea of democracy. <laughs> they wanted us to be a republic. And uh, matter of fact, if you do we pledge allegiance to the flag for the democracy for which it stands? Or uh, that Civil War song, uh, is it the battle hymn of the democracy? <laughs> no, it's the republic. The framers intended for us to be a uh, republic. But after I get, over, get finished telling the person that, I say, well, uh, a majority consensus does not establish morality. That is, I don't find gang rape any better, any better than individualized rape. That is, just because you vote to rape somebody doesn't make it right. Just because you vote to take somebody's money uh, to give to another does not make it right. Now, a lot of people will tell us, uh, you, you might have learned on your college campuses or you hear on the news, that we need a big and powerful government to offset the bigness and the alleged power of industrial giants like IBM, AT&T, Chrysler. Uh, now, that's nonsense. Here's an industrial giant like uh, Exxon. In order for Exxon to get a dollar from me, what must happen? I must voluntarily get out of my chair, voluntarily drive in my car into the man's lot, and voluntarily hand him some money for some gasoline. Where's the coercion? Now, that does not describe my relationship with the government. The government can get dollars from me whether I want to give it to them or not, even if it required going over my dead body. The, the government, in, in all places, is the major source of organized rape. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't say big business can get dollars from us whether we want to give it to them or not, but what do they have to do first? They have to get permission from our elected representatives to rip us off. And th that's why there's so many lobbies at state, lobbyists at the state capitol in Washington. They're getting permission to rip us off. Let me give you an example. Uh, now, the farmers in some places are having problems. Now, the farmers know where I live. I live in the Valley Forge area of Philadelphia. Now, if the farmers need some help, they can knock on my door and say, buddy, can you spare a dime to help me out? Now, I'd probably tell the farmers to go play in the traffic. And, <laughs> and, and they know that. And so what they do, they go to their senator and they say, well, senator, if we ask Williams to voluntarily help us out, he's going to tell us to go play in the traffic. So you, can you use your agents at the IRS to take his money to help us out? That's how big business can get dollars from us, whether we want to give it to them or not. They need to get permission from our elected representatives. Now, the free market and voluntary exchange are roundly condemned by many of today's uh, uh, people, defenders of what I call the new human rights. These defenders of new human rights are chief supporters of reduced private property rights, reduced rights to profits, they are anti-competition and pro-monopoly. And these people in our country and elsewhere, they believe that they have more intelligence and superior wisdom to the masses, and they believe that they have been ordained to forcibly impose that wisdom on the rest of us, whether we want to do it or not. Now, of course, these people who want to control our lives have what they consider to be good reasons but I'm here to tell you that every tyrant that has ever existed has had what the tyrant believed to be good reasons for limiting the, restrict the uh, freedoms of others. These people's plan in our country requires the elimination or at least the attenuation of the market. Now, why do tyrants <coughs> want to attack the market? The market, the free market, implies voluntary exchange. Tyrants do not trust that people behaving voluntarily will do what the tyrant thinks that they ought to do. So they want to replace the market through economic planning or industrial planning. Now, I'll give you a definition of economic planning to, rest you, to last you the rest of your lives. Economic planning is nothing more than the forcible superseding 
of somebody else's plan by the powerful elite. Let me give you a couple examples. I might plan to buy a, a Honda motorcycle from a Japanese producer. The powerful elite will say, Williams, we're going to supersede your plan through tariffs and quotas because we think you ought to buy a Harley Davidson. Or my daughter might plan to work for the hardware store guy down the street for four dollars an hour. He says it's okay, she says it's okay, her mother says it's okay, and her father says it's okay. But the powerful elite will say, we're going to supersede that plan because it's not being transacted at the price we think it ought to be transacted at, namely the current minimum wage. Now, again, many people do all this in the name of good. But do-gooders fail to realize that most good is not done in the name of good. In other words, if you were to ask me, Williams, what, motiv what, what wonderful human motivation gets wonderful things done? I would say greed. I love greed. Now when I say greed, I'm not talking about fraud, robbing, misrepresentation, things like this. I'm talking about people trying to get more for themselves. That's what gets wonderful things done. And you know, a lot of people say, Williams, you know, since you're trying to win friends and enlighten people, uh, and, and win friends and influence people, why don't you say enlighten self-interest instead of greed? I like greed better. <laughs> now let me give you an example of that, because you might not have thought of it this way. Now last winter you had Texas cattle rangers, ranchers, getting up in the middle of the night in a blizzard, running down stray cows, maybe trying to inoculate them, maybe trying to feed them, making this personal sacrifice to ensure that New Yorkers would have beef on their shelves. This summer you have Idaho potato farmers getting up in the early in the morning doing back-breaking work, sun beating down their head, and bugs biting them, dirt underneath their fingernail, making this personal sacrifice to make sure New Yorkers also have potatoes on their shelves. Now, why do you think they're doing that? Do you think they're doing that because they love New Yorkers? <laughs> they may hate New Yorkers. I'm not that wild about New Yorkers myself. <laughs> they may hate New Yorkers, but they make sure that beef and potatoes gets to New York every single day. I think that's wonderful. But why do they do it? Because they want more for themselves. You know, let me give you another example. There are you know, millions of examples. I think it's wonderful that most of you have automobiles. Now, do you think you're having that automobile because some people in Detroit care about you? <laughs> they don't give a damn about you. If you met one another, you might start fighting. <laughs> but why do you have that automobile? Because they care about themselves. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you, in case of New Yorkers getting beef and potatoes, how much beef and potatoes you think New Yorkers would have if it all depended on human love and kindness? <laughs> I feel sorry for New Yorkers. <laughs> Let me give you another example of the virtue of greed and private property rights. Now, I've often said to people that I don't care very much about future generations. Uh, if, uh, you know, future generations of Americans. And some people think it's horrible, and they say, Williams, how come you don't care about future generations? I ask them, what have future generations ever done for me? <laughs> I mean, some kid that's going to be born in 2050, what has he done for me? And if he has not done anything for me, how then am I obliged to do anything for him? Where is the quid pro quo? There is none. But however, if you watch my actual behavior, my actual behavior would belie that sentiment. That is, a number of years ago, <clears throat> I have a nice spread in, in Devon, Pennsylvania, and I took $400 that I could have consumed selfishly all by myself. I could have bought two nice bottles of Chateau de Cam Sauternes wine. <laughs> and nobody would have benefited from it except me. But instead, I took that $400 and 
and I planted seedlings around my property. Now, when, when those trees reach their full maturity, I'll be dead. There'll be some 20, 50 kids swinging in my tree, eating my <laughs> apples and my pears. <laughs> Mrs. Williams has made extensive improvements to our house with my money. <laughs> um, including a beautiful sunroom. Now, that sunroom, I'm going to be dead, and that sunroom's going to still be there, benefiting some 2050 kid tracking mud in my sunroom. Now, the question, what's at least some of the incentive that, uh, for me to sacrifice personal consumption for some good that's going to long outlast me and benefit future generations? The answer is very easy. The nicer my house is, the longer the, uh, it will provide housing services, what? The higher the price I get when I go to sell my house. That is by pursuing my own narrow selfish interests, I can't help but make a house available for a future generation, whether I mean to or not. Now ask yourself the question, would I have those same incentives if the government owned my house? Would I have the same incentives if there were a 75% transfer tax when I went to sell my house? No, I wouldn't. Anything that weakens my private property in the house weakens my incentive to do the socially responsible thing, namely conserve on the scarce resources of our society. Let me just give you one more example. You people look like nice people. I don't know whether you're nice at all. <laughs> but, but many of you could be concerned about the extinction of various animals. I personally don't give a damn. <laughs> and, and it's a practical matter. Because according to biologists, 93% of everything that has ever lived on Earth is now extinct. And I say, why quibble over 93.1 or 0.2%? You know, <laughs> so what? But a lot of people are, are concerned about it. You know, they're concerned about the bald eagle. Uh, you know, I saw, I was 35 years old when I saw my first bald eagle in the Philadelphia Zoo. And I was looking at the critter in the cage. And I was asking myself, could I have gone another 35 years <laughs> without seeing it? And I concluded, yes. But, <laughs> but I, I appreciate <clears throat> that different people have different values. But anyway, the point of the story is that a number of years ago, I was listening to uh, NPR, and people were picketing the UN uh, because they're concerned about the extinction of the whale, uh, they, or, or the white rhino, or the gorilla in, in different countries in Africa and Asia. And they're forming clubs. You know, they had uh, ducks unlimited clubs, they had save the whale clubs, etc. You had a whole list of animals. So I wrote down a list of animals that people are in a tizzy over, possibly coming extinct. Then I wrote down another list of animals that are very valuable to us, but Nobody's in a tizzy over them. I said, how come people are not marching for the chicken? <laughs> or, or forming pig clubs? Or save the cow club? Now, what's the essential difference between these two lists of animals? Well, with this list of animals, cows, chickens, and sheep, they belong to somebody. It's the personal, private property of somebody. Somebody's personal wealth is at stake. With this list of animals, they don't belong to anybody. Nobody's personal private wealth is at stake. And so the point is, is that if you're concerned about these animals, uh, you should try to privatize them. Uh, now, despite these uh, virtues of the free market, and never mind, it was with the rise of capitalism that brought about a more humane society. <clears throat> and and it was with the rise of capitalism that saw better treatment to women, better treatment to racial minorities, better treatment to the insane, better treatment to criminals. You know, I was giving, a lecture, <clears throat> giving this lecture at one campus, and one lady stood up. Uh, she was a feminist. I don't call them what, what Rush calls them. But, uh, she said, capitalism, American capitalism is oppressive of women. And so I asked her, I said, if you are a radical feminist, where do you want to live? Is it in Saudi Arabia, China? You want to live in the United States. Or if you are a criminal, where do you want to go to jail? Uh, Turkey or Mexico? You want to go to jail in the United States so you don't miss your HBO shows in the afternoon. 
And the simple reason that the rise of capitalism brought about a more humane society, which is a subject for another lecture, <coughs> I'm sorry, is that before the rise of capitalism, the means to great wealth was obtained through, uh, you could obtain great wealth through plundering, looting, and enslaving your fellow man. With the rise of capitalism, it became possible to accumulate great wealth by pleasing your fellow man, by serving your fellow man. That is, why is Bill Gates so, so rich? Did he take his money from anybody? No, he pleased me enough with his Windows program that I forked over uh, two or three hundred dollars voluntarily. Now, many people say that the capitalism doesn't work. Well, maybe the one of the reasons that free markets are not allowed to work. And almost every group in our nation has come to feel that the government owes them a special privilege. Uh, manu and conservatives are by no means exempt from the process. Manufacturers think that government owes them protective subsidies, keep foreign goods so they can out so they can charge you and I higher prices. Organized labor feels that uh, the government ought to keep their jobs protected from those who are not union members. College professors, intellectuals, feel that the government should give them funds for research. Uh, that is, college professors love to get three and four and five hundred thousand dollar grants to do studies on poverty and then have meetings in a nice hotel in Miami during the winter to talk about poor people. Um, conservatives as well as liberals, Democrats as well as Republicans, prove H.L. Mencken's definition of election quite correct. H.L. Mencken, for those of you who've forgotten, he was a political satirist for the Baltimore Sun. And somebody asked H.L. Mencken to give the definition of an election one year. And H.L. Mencken replied, government is a broker in pillage. And every election is an advance auction on the sale of stolen goods. <laughs> now, to the extent that H.L. Mencken is correct, we've identified our problem. That is, we can, many of us want to blame politicians for our problem. And yes, we can blame them just a little bit. But ladies and gentlemen, the blame, the bulk of the blame lies with you and me. Because politicians are doing what we elect them to office to do. And what do we elect them to office to do? We elect them to office to use the power of their office to take what belongs to one American and bring it back to us. That's what we do. Imagine, and you say, oh, no, oh, Williams, you got Delaware all wrong. We're not like that in Delaware. <laughs> well, imagine I'm running for the Senate in Delaware. And I go around the state and I say, look, I read the United States Constitution. If you elect me to the Senate, don't expect for me to bring back highway construction funds, aid to higher education, meals on wheels, prescription drugs. Do you think I would get elected to the Senate from Delaware? No, I wouldn't, because I wouldn't be doing what Delawareans wanted me to do. Now, here's the problem. Here's the tragic aspect of that problem. You're not electing me to the Senate would be absolutely the correct thing in terms of your own economic interest. Why? Because if I don't bring back billions of dollars to Delawareans in various government programs, that doesn't mean that you'll pay a lower federal income tax. All that it means is that Pennsylvania will get it instead. <laughs> that is, once legalized theft begins, it pays for everybody to participate. And those who choose not to participate will wind up holding the brown end of the stick. And those of you with a rural background understand <laughs> what that means. <laughs> Let me just close by saying that I'm sure that if the founders came back, um, they'd be very disappointed with us for sacrificing our liberty for what we see as safety and not really having both either. But the most optimistic thing I can see is that Americans have never done the wrong thing for a long time. But we, there's, in other words, there's time for change.
it's time for us to rein in the government and put it back where the framers of the Constitution wanted it to be. And But we better get about doing the job before it's too late. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I believe on my website, I have uh, when James Madison, actually the father of the, uh, of the Constitution, um, when he was president, he vetoed a public works bill and saying that public works is not authorized by the United States uh, Constitution. And uh, there's another interesting quote, uh, and which is uh, some of these, uh, some, when you think about it, is really tragic, uh, tragic because these founders, these great men that founded our nation, if they were running for election today, Americans would run them out of town on a rail. I mean, here's a quote from Madison. Um, you know, the, in, in 19, I mean, I'm sorry, 1792 or 94, uh, Congress appropriated $15,000 to help some French refugees. James Madison stood on the floor of the house irate, and here's his quote. I cannot undertake to lay my finger on that article in the Constitution, which granted a right to Congress of expending on the objects of benevolence the money of their constituents. Now, close to three quarters of the federal budget today is on the objects of benevolence. Over 50% is for uh, Social Security, Medicaid, and Medicare. Now, when someone says, well, we need a certain program, I always ask, what did we do before that? That is, people say, well, we need Social Security. We just must have Social Security. Well, we've been a nation from 1787 until 1936, when the Social Security uh, bill was written. And what in the world happened to, to older people? I'll tell you what happened the most time. It was that older people died in the homes of their children. Their children took care of them. That is, they respected the, I, the idea or the biblical admonition to honor their mother and father. Uh, now, uh, there's less honoring of mothers and fathers today because young people find that they can get me through the tax code to honor their mother and father instead. Uh, or people say, well, we, we just have to have food stamps. And I'm saying, well, well, in 1840s, when the poor Irish were coming here, uh, getting arriving here uh, with absolutely nothing but the clothes on their back, when they got off in Ellis Island, do you think they were handed out food stamps? How in the world did they make it? And Or people say, oh, we need the housing and urban development. Well... The Housing Urban Development uh, Administration, it came about, I think, in late 1950s or something like this. And, and we uh, Americans had built cities that were a testament to man's ingenuity and wealth. How did they do it without the Housing Urban Development? And then after the Housing Urban Development uh, was, uh, uh, became law and had a great big administration, cities started going down the tubes. Or we say, oh, we need an education department. Well, the Education Department was uh, uh, set up in, in the 1970s. And SAT scores have been going down ever since. <laughs> and so I always, you always ask people, well, what did we do before? Or let's say the uh, science, uh, you know, grants to, uh, uh, to do uh, various kinds of research. Well, Americans were picking up the Nobel Prizes in huge numbers long before we had great government involvement. I believe that the private sector can do most of what, and, and matter of fact, they can do most of even, they can do a lot of stuff even militarily. If I were the President of the United States, you know what I would do in terms of capturing, let's say, a terrorist like uh, bin Laden? I would just give a, let's say, a $25 million bounty and say, whoever goes out and kills this man and brings me back his head gets $25 million. And I bet you would see his head on a plate pretty soon. I mean, there are a lot of things that can be done uh, privately instead of uh, through government operation be done cheaper. Yes?
two important aspects that I see. One is the, well, the aspects of liberty, which you discussed. The other, which you touched on, I think it requires more study, is the great efficiency of the free enterprise system. And I think lots of people, many legislators, don't even have a clue. And yeah. What can we do about that? What are your views on that? Well, there's, if there's one great shortcoming of the economics profession, and, and that is not making our ideas that are fairly simple to explain uh, more accessible to the general public. Um, and just the idea, you know, some simple ideas uh, that, that private, you know, for example, if you say, if you ask the question, Americans complain about a number of things. And what do they complain about, mostly? Uh, do they complain about supermarkets? No, not much. Or, or, or their computers? Or their clothing? No, what do they complain about? They complain about the things that are produced by government. Things like public schools, public education, uh, the post office, the motor vehicle department. Uh, and why? Well, there's no profit uh, incentive at work. In, in government agencies. That is, they can get money from you uh, to support their salaries, whether you like it or not. That is, public schools, in terms of, of the quality of education, has been going downhill. What has been happening to the salaries of teachers and administrators? They've been going up. Now, the, the free market is ruthless in terms of its accountability standards. That is, firms, private firms, they face ruthless competition they face bankruptcy they, uh, if, they, if they don't make a profit. They're, there's ruthless uh, efforts uh, uh, or mechanisms to make them satisfy uh, their customers. No such um, uh, mechanism exists uh, in, in the government arena because people who work for the government, they are accountable to politicians. Not so much you and you and me, but to politicians, that is, they, uh, um, their welfare depends on their pleasing politicians. Yeah. Yes, and you're clear. Um, <clears throat> disdain for redistributionism, which I also share. Would you make any exception at all in the area of education? Obviously, the Department of Education wasn't listed among the 21 things you mentioned that the federal government would be involved in. But without some redistributionism, wouldn't we back to the system where only the wealthy could afford a tutor or someone else for their children? No, I, <clears throat> well, well, first of all, when people talk about redistribution, let's say income redistribution, I know the, the gentleman wasn't raising that question, um, I always point out that that's, that's, that describes the activity of thieves. You know, thieves are involved in income redistribution. That is to take money from one person and give it to themselves. But in terms of education, I think that Long before there's public education, there was private education. That is, where towns would hire a school mom. They had the one-room houses, and they, you know, at that uh, early uh, uh, period. And I think that we did not get public education any significant degree until the 1900s. And so you say, well, what did we do before then? We provided it privately. And then, if you look at the the uh, the education. Uh, for let's say for particularly for black kids and keep in mind when I make these comments the education that white kids receive is nothing to write home about but the education received by poor black kids who cannot afford uh, private uh, uh, education is abominable I mean that is the, the statistics are that today a black kid holding a high school diploma in his hand he has the academic achievement level, the average, has the academic achievement of a sixth or seventh grade white kid. I mean, it is, it is an abomination. And now, it does not have to be that way. Um, there are a number of black found and uh, owned and operated private schools. And my wife and uh, I, we are very familiar because we give scholarships. Uh, one of them is in Philadelphia, Ivy Leaf School in Philadelphia. There's Marva Collins School, Preparatory School in Cincinnati, and Marcus Garvey School, and I can name some others. But let me just say about these schools, these private schools, where the kids are low and moderate income, uh, uh, from low and moderate income families, many, many of them from female-headed households, at these schools, uh, 
95% above and above, 95% of the kids score at grade level and up to six years above grade level. And this is not, uh, and, and the tuition at these schools runs anywhere from two to $4,000 a year. And keep in mind, in most city schools, in the most public schools, you're talking about a per, per capita school uh, uh, expense of $6,000 per kid. And in Washington, D.C., it's $14,000 uh, per kid. And Washington, D.C. public schools, I, I know the head of the public school in Washington, D.C., they're hoping, I know that they have to be hoping, that Mississippi does not secede from the Union. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, they would be dead last in terms of uh, academic achievement. So I think what needs to be done in education is just to introduce more competition. That, look in our lives where we see ruthless competition. Aren't we the most pleased? I mean, supermarkets, com computer uh, companies, software companies, clothing companies in ruthless competition against one another. And, and it produces a pleasing product. Yeah. My name is Marcus McBride. I work here in ISI. All my friends are conservatives. Uh, I'm asking this question for a gentleman in the crowd. I, I don't believe he's liberal, but he would like to know your opinion on uh, eminent domain as ties to uh, the rule ruling in New London. Well, I, I, I have problems with uh, eminent domain in general. Uh, that is, my own particular values are that the, uh, there should be no takings whatsoever for any reason. Uh, but but uh, in turn, the, the Constitution says, the Fifth Amendment says, that nor shall private, be, uh, private property be taken for public use without just comp uh, compensation. Now, the case in, uh, in, uh, in New London, the Kilo case, and, and, and other cases around the country, the, the courts or the local jurisdiction um, was taking, was condemning private property that was in good shape, it was not run down, and they were condemning it and handing it over to other private people. Now, the Constitution says for public use, that is, uh, a property can be condemned to build a fort, to build a dam, or some other public use like that. But the courts interpret public purpose. That is, the, the reason why the jurisdiction was taking that property, condemning that property, is because, let me use the hypothetical numbers, in terms of tax revenue, they're only getting, the city was only getting, let's say, $10,000 in tax revenue. But if they turn it over to this huge pharma pharmaceutical and development, and once the buildings are built, they would get, let's say, $200,000 in tax revenue. So the city was looking at tax revenues, and they were calling the higher tax revenues that they would get uh, public purpose. They were serving a public purpose. But the Constitution says public use. And, um, and we ought to be, all of us ought to be afraid of, uh, of, the, uh, of that precedent that it sets. But the good note uh, is um, that many states, I believe like 36 states, have already amended their state constitutions so as to place greater protections on private property. And if you're, and if you're interested in this eminent domain issue, uh, check out, um, uh, it's an institute for justice, it's ij.org, and they've done a lot of work in supporting the uh, uh, victims of eminent domain abuse. Yeah. Good afternoon. I am the daughter of an Idaho potato farmer and grew up on that farm. We also had beef cattle. Mm -hmm. uh, I just want everybody to know we don't have anything personal against the Yorkers. We think they're hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> and you send it there. You get me good. <clears throat> I grew up with my father, listening to my father rail and complain against farm subsidies and the problems that government interference was making for farms. So I really have two questions. One is what do you think would happen to American agriculture, which really is, you know, the, probably the most important industry we have? And two, are we still giving our tax dollars to um, uh, subsidize tobacco growing? Yeah. No, we, we, look, um, I prefer not to use the term subsidy. I mean, I, I call it uh, handouts, farm handouts. Um, and... Um, 
or I call aid to dependent farmers. <laughs> um, but I think the huge problem, our agricultural problem in our country is surplus. That is too much. That is, we're giving away food, we're uh, burning food, we're dumping food. And uh, so we do not have an agriculture pro uh, problem. Maybe one of the problems is that because of the subsidies, we're keeping farms in business that should fail. That is, uh, uh, and, and, but we're, and the government, you know, taxpayers pay for this in two ways. The number one, through the subsidies, and then the cost of storing the stuff. And taxpayers pay another way. That is, uh, <clears throat> because of the tariffs and quotas on foreign sugar coming in the United States, America, keeping our foreign sugar, uh, <clears throat> Uh, in order to benefit the incomes of rich uh, sugar growers in the United States and their workers, uh, Americans pay three to four times the world price for sugar. And, uh, and we're doing that to, uh, to make wealthy a tiny segment of the American people, the people uh, in the uh, sugar growing uh, industry. And so, yes, uh, there's, no, there's nothing in the Constitution that that uh, would uh, suggest that Congress is authorized to make uh, uh, payments to sugar uh, growers. Now, a lot of people say, well, Williams, such and such a program is a good idea. Well, our Constitution is not based on good ideas. That is, uh, for example, I lift weights uh, about three or four times a week, and I bike on the weekends at least 40 miles. I think that's a good idea. Now, should I try to get Congress to make it a law that everybody had to do that? It's a good idea. But so the question that we have to ask ourselves is not whether something is a good idea. We have to ask, is it permissible by the United States Constitution? That's the question that we have to ask. Today, uh, we've heard you talk a lot about taxation voluntary giving of taking of dollars and giving them to those who don't wish to, wish to have those dollars uh, under the current tax system. Uh, I believe you may probably be in favor of the fair tax concept, which is based on consumption, and in particular where that consumption tax is levied on at the retail level on those purchases we voluntarily choose to make. Mm -hmm. Uh, could you give us your, your view on that? Well, um, the gentleman's talking about the fair tax and has been pro proposed by Congressman Linder, and uh, there's actually a book written uh, called The Fair Tax. And I think that the fair tax, which would impose about a, I think the estimates are a 23% sales tax on everything that we buy, and, and, but it would get rid of the income tax or any other tax. It would just be 23%. And actually, in, in terms of what we pay each year is more than 23% of our income on taxes. Um, now, I think that it's a reasonable, it would be a reasonable improvement over the status quo. But the only way that I would support a sales tax is that if we could repeal the 16th Amendment, creating the income tax. Because if, we if Congress enacted a, a, uh, a sales tax, a the fair tax, sooner or later we would find ourselves with a sales tax and an income tax. So, and I think that it's not politically feasible to repeal the income tax. I would like to see it done, but I don't see, I don't see that in, in the political horizon. So failing that, uh, I would prefer a flat tax, uh, a flat income tax, such as uh, uh, Dick Armey was uh, pushing for a long time when he was uh, in the Congress. And Dick Armey's uh, flat tax would be 17%. You just uh, add up your income. I think you had deductions for uh, children, no other deduction, and just 17% and send it in. And this applied to both individuals individuals and corporations and any other uh, form of taxing. 
I think that would be a significant improvement over the status quo, given that I don't believe that we're going to repeal the 16th Amendment. I don't see it in the political winds. Now, if we did, if, we, if it were possible to repeal it, I think I would go for the, uh, the uh, fair tax. Thank you very much for your talk today. I actually have two questions, and if you would answer either one, that would be superb. Okay. And one of my questions is with regard to outsourcing of um, labor and production and that sort of thing, how do you think outsourcing influences the status or nature of our free market economy here? And secondly, is there a mechanism or a series of things that the American public can do to kind of wean ourselves off of the current system and still have a level of stability in government and society that would be acceptable to its citizens? Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, first, the outsourcing. Uh, outsourcing meaning that companies will, uh, uh, let's say, They'll have call stations in India instead of, in which they can uh, operate at cheaper uh, labor costs, uh, or out, outsourcing certain uh, uh, supplies um, uh, that they need in the uh, in the assembly of stuff here. Uh, I think that when a company, when a particular company, and or collections of companies find that they can produce something cheaper by using resources that are available in some other place, I think that makes us all better off. That is, we, are always, we, we will always appreciate an increase in the standard of living if we can get stuff cheaper, the same quality stuff uh, cheaper. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> I mean, it, we either increase our standard of living by uh, increasing income or lowering prices or having prices uh, not go up as the rate that they otherwise would uh, go up. And I think that some of the evidence shows that uh, outsourcing has been very valuable in terms of creating jobs in the United States. Uh, of course, some jobs are lost, but there's more, it's more than made up by the number of jobs uh, created. That is, because companies can produce certain aspects of their uh, production cheaper, they're able to expand their operation. In the process of expanding the operation, they increase uh, employment. And I think that the statistics are, I have, them, I have them available on my website, but I think the statistics are since 2001, uh, between 2001 and 2005, we've outsourced something like 2 million jobs. But in the same process, insourcing was about 5 million jobs. That is, you find companies such as Novartis. I believe Novartis is based in uh, in uh, Switzerland. Uh, you find Toyota, uh, Nissan, and other companies uh, building uh, plants and operations in the United States. Now, it seems like those other countries they would be the complainers of outsourcing because we are a net, uh, a net beneficiary of outsourcing from their company, their country because they find producing certain things are cheaper in the United States. Um, but a lot of people are worried about jobs. But in a fr when, when jobs are destroyed through free markets, then we're all better off. Uh, and let me give you an idea of that, because you, know, you might not even think of it this way. As a matter of fact, oh, some years ago, it's back, back during the 80s, I was testifying in Congress. And one congressman said, uh, Professor Williams, our job is to save jobs. And so I asked him, what would you have done to save the Iceman's job or the stagecoach driver's job? Uh, as jobs are destroyed through the natural forces of the market mechanism, we're all enriched. Um, and so I would never worry about uh, uh, destroying jobs. Now, clearly, I would say that the person who loses his job as a result of outsourcing or as a result of automation, he's made worse off. He has to find some other job. And many times, it turns out, when they do find other jobs, they find the job was better than the job they lost. Yeah. You made it clear earlier that you were comfortable with um, Congress appropriating funds for the maintenance of the national defense, yeah. international and domestic drug. 
Um, are you similarly comfortable or would you be uncomfortable with the idea of um, federal funding um, for um, public health in not necessarily by a terrorist, because everyone is aware of anthrax and stuff, but involuntarily um, caused public health crises like drug resistant tuberculosis and things of that nature, waterborne, airborne pathogens. Um, do you think, because pharmaceutical companies currently have little to no incentive to pursue that kind of research uh, in the private sector because, frankly, there's more money in finding a cure for impotence and Alzheimer's than there is in drug-resistant tuberculosis or sickle cell anemia, for instance. Um, and when they do find a product that does successfully combat something like anthrax, for instance, uh, following the scares at the Senate and House um, you know, buildings a, a bunch of years ago, um, the government basically told the pharmaceutical company responsible for making Cipro that this is what we will pay for the drug rather than what it's worth on the free market. So are you in favor or against um, congressional you know, or federal funding of public health type things that could be considered national defense? Well, I think that, uh, you know, as I said in, the, in my talk, that, that Congress, the Constitution, requires that Congress produce certain public goods in the name of, of the general welfare. Now, when the, when the Congress, when the founders used the term general welfare, they meant things that would benefit all Americans, not particular Americans. Now, clearly, um, communicable diseases, doing something about communicable diseases, typhoid, tuberculosis, and, and other diseases that are communicable, uh, surely there's a case, because that's a public good. It benefits everybody. Um, but surely there's not a case for government investing in, let's say, sickle cell uh, anemia or, or some of the other uh, uh, diseases. Uh, now, I think that one of the things you mentioned, FDA, I think that one of the problems in getting drugs and the advancement of drugs on markets is precisely the FDA. That's a big problem. And a lot of people, just plain, Americans just plain don't know this, and they fall victim to, uh, uh, to, to the charlatans and quacks. And just let me briefly, there's a whole lot of literature on this, but let me just briefly explain. The FDA, an official at the FDA, he can make two kinds of errors. That is, he can make, if you remember your statistics, the type 1 and type 2 error, which simply means that the FDA official, he can, make, he can err on the side of under caution, that is, approve a drug that has unanticipated deadly side effects. Or he can... Uh, make an error on the side of overcaution, that is, not approve or does delay approval of a drug that's perfectly safe and effective. Now, in terms of the incentives of the FDA official, what are his incentives? His incentives are to err on the side of overcaution, because if he errs on the side of undercaution, such as having a whole bunch of thalidomide babies in Congress embarrassing him, he'll lose his job. So he errs on the side of overcaution. Now, let me just give you some examples of overcaution. Uh, in the 1970s um, and 80s, there was a particular beta blocker that dealt with the uh, second, secondary effects of myocardial infarction that had been used in Europe and Japan for like 12 years, but had not been approved for use in the United States. There's a, um, a couple of professors of medicine at different places, one at the University of Rochester, they did a study, and they estimated that by not having this drug available to Americans, roughly 10,000 Americans died each year of the secondary effects of myocardial infarction that would not have died had that drug been available. Now, that's wonderful for FDA official. Why? Because the victims are invisible. That is, they, they don't know why they died. Their families don't know why they died. So he's off the hook. But if he approves a drug that has unanticipated dangerous side effects, such as maybe Vioxx or, for some people, or thalidomide, he has this embarrassment in Congress. The victims are visible. So many of the problems we face in our country is a result of, of invisible victims, and, and, and nobody really knows uh, the, uh, uh, the cost. And then there's another issue with drugs. Because of expensive and often useless um, procedures of FDA, it is for the average cost of getting a drug from the, pharm from the chemist who says, aha, I have an idea, to that drug being marketed on, it's about a billion dollars per drug. 
It's close to, not quite, it's about 900, uh, 900 million dollars per drug. Now, what happens as a result of this? Okay, I'm the CEO of the drug company. You're some bright scientist, and you come to me and you say, aha, I have a drug idea for the treatment of this disease. Can we go forward? And so I say, look, that, that's, that, that's a rare disease. Not many people have that disease. Only about 50,000 Americans have that disease. But it's going to cost me $900 million to get that drug to the market. I say, no, I'm not, I'm not going to go ahead on that. And we call, there's a whole class of drugs called orphan drugs. That is, there are drugs available to treat some disease, but they're just plain not profitable to produce. That is because uh, if, the, if the drug company produced them, if sooner or later the drug company would be out of business. It's just not profitable to produce. And so there are many problems involved with the FDA uh, that an American say, oh, it's a wonderful, if I had it my way, I would get rid of the FDA and replace it with something like United Laboratories. You know, the United Laboratories, you know, you look for on electrical equipment, you look for the UL seal. And the UL and the United Laboratories, they go around to, all, to, to companies and they test their electrical equipment. They, they come back and they do random tests to make sure that it's worth the UL seal. And, uh, and they have the incentives to do the right thing, whereby those incentives don't exist. Matter of fact, one FDA official said, regarding my argument about uh, uh, the type 1 and type 2 errors, he says, look, he says, there have been no congressional hearings at all in the history of the FDA whereby the FDA official was brought to Congress for being oversafe. But there have been a lot of hearings where they're brought to Congress for being undersafe. So, thank you. One more question. My question concerns something that there's not a lot of agreement among conservatives about. So I was wondering if you'd comment. By the way, I'm not a conservative. Oh, okay. Good. Good. A, a Jeffersonian liberal. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, concern, um, a free trade policy concerning immigrant labor would be to have open borders. Are you, uh, oh, uh, well, I believe in free trade. My sentiments about immigrants coming into that country are expressed at the uh, foot of the, uh, of, the, of the Statue of Liberty. The law firm are all familiar with it, but I believe they should all come legally. That is, I do not believe that people around the world have a right to live in the United States regardless of our laws. I think that they should obey our laws. And the history of our country is a history of immigrants um, uh, from all over the world. And matter of fact, that's one of the wonderful things, I believe that's one of the wonderful things about our country that's made us such a great country is that we have a mix of people from all over the world. Now, years ago when the immigrants were coming, there was no welfare state and we were guaranteed that they came here to work because they, they worked or died, or starved, which they did not starve, they worked. Now today, that's not as true. That is, people can come from all over the world and live off the rest of us because we have a welfare state. And in my opinion, we have too many Americans uh, living off, too many Americans living off of, of us. Now, so, so in general, I welcome anybody to come to this country. We have a plenty of room for many more people than we have uh, in our country right now. There's no risk of our becoming overcrowded. Um, by the way, you know, a student in an elementary, when I used to teach a very, the, the introductory course, some years ago, a student said, told me that we're becoming overcrowded. And so uh, I said, I don't believe that. And so by the next class me meeting, I'd done a little research and I, I added up all the uh, land in Texas, and I took out the water. I only include places where people go live. And I got the square acreage of land in Texas. And it turns out that at that time, 
we could put every single American in Texas, and each family of four would have 1.9 acres of land to live on. Uh, and, and then also I, I, uh, I'd add up all the square acres in Texas, Colorado, California, and Alaska. And it turns out that we could put every single person in the world and each family would have nine-tenths of an acre of land to live on. So when somebody says we're becoming overcrowded, uh, it's just say it's nonsense. And sometimes people, this is a little bit away from your question, but if I don't tell you these things, you're going to spend the rest of your life not knowing them. <laughs> but um, um, a lot of people say we need birth control to handle the world's problem because there's overpopulation in countries. Well, let me, let me give you some statistics. The Congo, the, the population density in the Congo is 39 people per square mile. This is going to be a hard question for you guys. In Hong Kong, it's 400,000 people per square mile. Which jurisdiction do you think is richer? <laughs> Matter of fact, if you want to find wealth in the world, a lot of times you go to densely populated people, places like New York, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, and, and many other, Switzerland, all the places in the world. Thanks. I really enjoyed uh, chatting with you guys. Thank you.